Okay. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for this lovely session. Today, I'm with Namwali Serpo. She and I were just uh, talking about our Chitenge prints and um, commiserating, reflecting, remembering our home country of Zambia. And so today, to spend some time with her book, celebrating her book, The Old Drift. And so technology is so wonderful because we're able to do the impossible. We're in Cleveland, in New York, and in Zambia. And books do the same thing. They transport us across space and time. So Namwali, thank you so much for introducing the world to Zambia through the old drift. Namwali Serpil is an award-winning author. Um, her book has won many awards. And actually, I would love for us to start off by you telling everyone about your most recent prize and what you did with that prize money. So thank you so much um, to um, Global Cleveland for having us. Thank you so much to the Annisfield Wolf Awards. Um, uh, that is the, the basis of the invitation for me to, to be with you all today. And thank you so much to Somo for um, interviewing me and for being in conversation with me today. So last week, I learned that my novel won a science fiction award. Um, so the Annisfield Wolf Award, um, which is based in Cleveland, is for works that are about race and diversity. And the award I won last week, the Arthur C. Clarke Award, is for science fiction. My novel's also been nominated for um, awards for historical fiction, other awards for science fiction, for first novels. So it was really it's very um, pleasing to me that the multi-genre quality of the novel is being recognized by um, these different uh, awards. Um, so I decided uh, when I won the Arthur C. Clarke Award because it the announcement coincided with the announcement that the police officers who killed Brianna Clark um, in Louisville had not been indicted. Um, I decided to donate that award to bail funds for protesters on the ground in, in Louisville because um, for a couple of reasons. One, I wanted to point out that every write, every kind of writing we do, even something that might seem as objective or as futuristic and as far away from our reality as science fiction is connected to politics. Um, and my novel very much tries to intertwine science fiction and political questions of equity and justice and race, in fact, as well. But I also just felt as a, a Black woman in America, you know, um, I became an American citizen a few years ago. Um, there was something too um, conflictual in my heart about being honored as the first black woman to ever receive that um, science fiction award while women like me are still subject to state sanctioned violence. Um, and literally, you know, this person was murdered and it was deemed illegal. Um, and I just, I couldn't quite reconcile those two things. Um, so I decided the best way for me to honor her, um, especially given that it's an award for a novel that is about uh, the oppression of people across the world, um, I decided to donate it to, to those protesters. Thank you so much, Namali, for sharing that. Um, I thought that would be such a great point to start on because your novels hinged on these themes of social justice, activism, feminism, and so on. Um, and you wrap all of these things together in an accessible way, in a way that is easy to relate to. And as a Zambian myself, mm -hmm. um, I connected so strongly with these narratives. And so um, I, I seek in my work at Baldwin Wallace University to connect my students to the world. And, and your book just did such a wonderful job with that. So thank you so much. Um, my, my next question has to do with how you started the book. Why, um, why did you start there? So at the beginning of the book, introduce um, world to to Zambia and the old drift. So 
I'll, I'll let you go ahead and explain that a little bit. So, um, as the someone has said, this um, novel is a novel about conflict, about standards, and then trying to write uh, a story of nations that um, emerge out of human settlements is, a, is quite a complicated matter. When the borders were drawn around what is now Zambia um, back in the 19th century, uh, some of those borders cut directly through villages. Um, this is a, a kind of joke that we have in my family is that the border um, between Tanzania and, and Zambia went right through my mother's village. And so the chief sent half, half of his people over to the other side and sent his sister over to become the chieftainess. And then that's what we have um, why I it. This is why now we have a matriarchal tribe in Zambia. So it's like, you know, these, these this thing was made by by colonial power, um, ended up roping together a very large and very diverse group of, of Africans. We have seven main tribes at home, 72 dialects. Um, and so this idea of you know trying to figure out what actually is a Zambian nation, what what exactly is a nation, um, is, is quite tricky. And um, at some point in, I want to say 2014, 2013, I went home to visit and I took a friend of mine and we went to Livingston, which is where the, the great Victoria Falls um, are. And um, we went on a little safari in the Victoria Falls Game Park. And they pulled into this grove and they said, um, okay, time for tea and biscuits. So anyone who has been on, on safari in Zambia knows they, they love people to tea. Um, so they give you rooibos and, and these little shortbread biscuits to eat some more. And we hopped out, and but it, there weren't any animals, but there were these gravestones. And they said, oh, yeah, this is the old church cemetery. And I walked around, and I was like, what is this? And there was this plaque explaining that this was an early colonial settlement on the banks of the Mississippi River, right above Victoria Falls. And you know, I think it's 13 people, maybe 17 people are in these in these systems that have fallen down, and um, several of them are illegible. Uh, so I, you know, when I came home, I did some googling and I did some research, and that turned into you know a year or two's worth of, of reading and, and research. And I learned about this place that all that's left of it now is a graveyard, but it was this place where all of these people from uh, around the world, like from Germany, from England, from Italy, um, and then all of these people from the local population had gathered to settle this place. At its, at its peak, it was maybe a hundred so people. Um, and then they all died of malaria because they were too close to the river. And I thought, what a, what a, a fitting place <laughs> to, to try to understand the, the combination of Multiculturalism, right? The, I, this sense that Zambia is a very multicultural country, which is not something that a lot of people know if they're not from there. Um, but also that this is also a place of um, that marks uh, a history of conflict between people. Um, so I start that conflict by taking three historical figures that I learned about. One is an Italian hotelier, the first hotelier of the Victoria Falls Hotel, uh, Pietro Gavucci. One is a British man named Percy Cooper, who was a photographer, who considered himself an adventurer, and made his way to Africa to, to make his fortune, um, and wrote a book called The Autobiography of the Old Drifter, which I use um, as the basis for that first chapter. And a man named Ugo, who was, you know, from the, the local population and is mentioned in, in Percy's memoir as someone that he accidentally shot. Um, and so I decided to put these three men into relationship with each other and use that as a, a kind of inciting incident that then spirals into a, a cycle of retribution between the three families. So these three patriarchs intersect the deal with this, and then I follow the stories of their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren in so doing telling the story of my country. Yeah. Uh, and, and the way that you um, communicate those different stories um, is 
so beautiful and um, it's, it, it, it's so skillful. You, you navigate these aspects of multiculturalism, Eurocentrism versus Afrocentrism, um, and, and you highlight these themes of community um, individual exploration so beautifully. I, I find that um, in work, in international work, there is often the sense in which we think that solutions are found in the global north mm -hmm. and in the west. Um, the conversation that naturally occurs within your book lends us to lends us to this idea, this notion of maybe maybe there's some answers that might be embedded in mm -hmm. our African context, right? Maybe we found um, a way to exist mm -hmm. together um, in, in a more equitable fashion um, it, across across the yeah. pond in Zambia. So thank you so much. Yeah. So my next question has to do with those kinds of stereotypes. So um, we you've alluded to this this kind of Eurocentric world mm -hmm. that we live in. Um, and, and we see these themes even when we're home, right? When we're home, people might look at the work that we're doing in the US and think, oh, well, you're doing such great things over there and not necessarily think about the wonderful things that are happening mm -hmm. at home. Um, what, kinds of, what kinds of stereotypes were you hoping to disrupt as you told these stories, as you conveyed the perspectives of these various so, families? One of the primary ones was this idea that Africa is this kind of monolithic place um, and that uh, all of these different countries, um, you know, are, are, are quintessentially the same. I was very interested in trying to capture the a very specific uh, spirit of Zambianness. Um, and one of those things, as I said, is this sense that it's a place that's built out of many, many people coming into one place. And so there's a sense of, you know, saying that the, the borders around Zambia are very arbitrary, but we've made of that a kind of advantage. Um, so one of the, my favorite things to cite, which I, I um, record in the novel, is that when the British flag went down and the Zambian flag went up October 24th, 1954, anyone who was in the country was automatically Zambian, right? And our first president, Kenneth Cohen, mm -hmm. was a humanist, um, a socialist, and he was very uh, keen on uniting the country under the flag of one Zambia, one nation, which is something that we still say to each other, um, you know, kind of in a joking way. But it is very, I think, um, key to our sense both of us as a multicultural nation, as a multi-tribe nation, but also as, a, as an equitable nation, right? That everybody is guaranteed certain kinds of rights. And there's a really strong feminist stream in Zambian culture as well. And I wanted to trace that history um, in, in writing about the book. And so one of the things I'm doing is overturning, as you say, this idea that these um, I mean, African nations are all of a particular type, that they're kingdoms, that they, you know, um, you know, as much as I love Black Panther, I'm like, you know, we don't, very few African countries yeah. have kings and queens. Like we, you know, we have, we have chiefs and chiefs in the but we have democratic, governments that we chose that you know voting is really the voting in Zambia is more common and more frequent more consistent than it is you know what I mean so there's a sense uh, and, and everybody reads the newspapers you know you, as you drive down Great East Road there are people hawking newspapers with the, the, the political news of the day the news is delivered in local languages people are really engaged in a, in a democratic process. So that was one of the things I wanted to get. But there are also certain things about, you know, as you say, the very um, Eurocentric stereotypes, um, African stereotypes about what people are like, what black people are like, what white people are like, and what people, you know, in general called colored people who are mixed race are like. And so some of the tropes that I use in the novel are really trying to overturn those stereotypes. Um, so, for example, you know, um, the the people who are more kind of considered um, mythological or um, more like um, something out of an animist or um, uh, a, a, a religion that's oriented around 
um, the mystical are actually the white characters, right? So I have an Italian woman who was born covered with hair that continually grows. Um, needs to be, uh, she's one of the grandmothers, yeah. and she moves to Zambia and stays there. Um, and you know, there's a sense that you know, well, you know, everybody uh, in Italy looks at her as a kind of monster. When she gets to Zambia, they're like, oh, she's just different like all the other white people who come, all the other Wazungu, as we call them, who come. So there are things that I've also trying to manipulate there in terms of reading the expectations. So like, oh, it's going to be about African witch hunts. And I'm like, actually, the, the person who's covered in hair and is considered a witch is actually the, the Italian woman. So there are things like also trying to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and so speaking of, of this, would you like to um, yeah, read sure. an excerpt from your book uh, that, that takes oh, place yeah, in 1904? Yeah. So, so, of independence. So, um, let me just give a, a little bit of context. So the novel, as I said, starts with the old script, with a kind of historical fiction genre and then moves into a kind of magical realist genre with the first generation of the grandmothers um and there are three there are three women in in the section and this one is um this chapter tells the story of Mata Mwamba, who is um a, a, a bemba woman um she's a girl at this stage who grows up in northern province and is taught by a man named um, Edward Mukukankuloso, who is very eager to um, start his own school and eventually recruits her um, when she is a teenager to um, what is called the, the Zambian Space Program. So I'm going to read just uh, a, a couple of pages from our introduction to, to the space program. And I'll be reading in my Zinglish accent, which I've explained to who we'll understands that the code switching that we do. Um, so you'll, you'll hear my accent is a little bit different as I read. 1964. The headquarters of the Zambia National Academy of Science, Space Research and Philosophy was in Tungabani, a forested area west of Lusaka, where the edge of the city bled into the edge of the bush. Minister of Space Research Edward Mkukam Kuloso walked among his cadets packing shoulders, adjusting capes, igniting cheer. As usual, he wore an army jacket and had covered his dreadlocks with his combat helmet, both preserved from his service in the Northern Rhodesian Regiment. But today he had festooned this sartorial jabbery with color, green silk trousers and a purple cape. The cameras would be filming in black and white, but it was important to suit oneself to the occasion. The Zambian space program was about to make its television debut. It was the height of the Cold War. The news that a fledgling African nation had joined the space race had hit the rest of the world like a scandal, pinging across the oceans, relaying around the planet like the very satellite that Nicolosa was shooting for. We will put the Zambian on the moon by the end of this year, he had solemnly promised at the first press conference. The technical details must remain secret. Some of our ideas are way ahead of the Americans and the Russians. Imagine the prestige value this would end for our new nation of Zambia. Most Westerners don't even know whereabouts in Africa we are. But they did now, Nkoloso smiled to himself. He had put his country on the world map by joining the race to leave the world altogether. He looked around at the reporters who had flown all the way to Zambia for the test launch. These were Zungu in shirt sleeves and spectacles, looked like yams roasting on an mbaola red and wet and bursting from the skin. Strangely reluctant to talk to people unless the cameras were rolling, the reporters were busying themselves with things instead, setting up tripods and scratching notes on paper and snapping photographs of Cyclops One. And Colossa admired his rocket from a distance. Cyclops One, a 10-foot copper cylinder, was propped on its end in the grass, listing to one side peaceably, its bottom quarter singed black from pre-launch testing. The takeoff had been disappointing from the point of view of spectacle. Cyclops 1 had only risen six feet before it crashed to the ground. The wood catapult he had been considering would not be powerful enough 
the Malolo system, while ideal for training cadets to withstand weightlessness, would never swing them far enough. Turbulent propulsion was the only way forward. Mr. Incoloso, a British reporter with a go-to step forward now, the camera rattling on its legs behind him. I understand that you have a rocket. Where is it? Yes, Juan Coloso said with his wry smile. He pointed at his rocket in the distance. That is my rocket, and with it we will go to the moon. And who will be the first landed on the moon? You have come at a most propitious moment, Coloso grinned. We have just decided which of our astronauts will have the place of honor in the space capsule for our historic moon shot. Mr. Godfrey Mwango has demonstrated an outstanding ability to walk on his hands. Walk on his hands, he says. Yes, that is the only way a man can transvest the moon given the gravity conditions. The reporter nodded, his neck tendons straining like tree roots. Mr. Mwango has also passed the acid test of any aspiring astronaut, Juan Colosso continued, simulated recovery from a space capsule following a landing on water. A fearsome test for a young man who has only just learned to swim. We must now prepare him for our anti-gravity drill. Juan Colosso bowed slightly and marched over to the empty oil tank. Godfrey would be placed inside and roll down the hill. The reporter turned and spoke directly into the camera. To those Zambians, these people are just a bunch of crackpots. And from what I've seen today, I'm inclined to agree. Martha Mwamba giggled at his voice. What did that man mean, cracked pot? Something broken and useless or something sharp and dangerous? Something that explodes on the fire like a bomb? These white people all spoke a strange and unwieldy English, an English that broke in no other tongue. Martha could barely understand them, especially the American who was now beckoning her over to his permanent spot under a tree. When she reached his station in the shade, he smiled at her, sweat hanging from his upper lip like a veranda after the rain. He introduced himself, Arthur Hawk, and asked her questions with his hilly, hairy accent. Her name, Martha, M-A-T-H-A, -A, she spelled it out carefully. Her age, 16. Her level of education, form one. His next questions were harder. She ran each one through a sort of thought experiment. What would one colossal say? What would be best for the academy? I hear you've been training to go into order, is that so? Yes, please, she said politely. It is so. I am the one going to Mars. You're way ahead of us. Pop grinned. We don't have any girls at NASA. Oh, is it? She giggled, covering her mouth with her hands. <laughs> Miss Mwamba, she leaned in confidentially. I hear you've been raising 12 cats as part of your training. What is their function? Yes, please. They are to give me companionship on the journey, but they are also, she took a deep breath to get the pronunciation right, technological accessories. Technological accessories? Yes, please. When I arrive on Mars, I will open the door of the rocket and we will drop the cats on the ground. If they survive, we will know that Mars is fit for human habitation. Pop laughed. And what will you and your cats do on Mars? This answer she had memorized from Juan Colossus op ed. Our telescopes have shown us that planet Mars is populated by primitive natives. A missionary will accompany me on my journey, but the missionary must not force Christianity on the Martians if they do not want it. Pop squinted at her, his smile wavering. <clears throat> and do you find space training thrilling, valuable, or merely routine? She thought for a moment. It is a bit worrisome. Miss Mwamba, how did you become an astronaut? When did you meet the director of the, he checked his notebook, Zambia National Academy of Science and Space Research and Philosophy, she added. Me, I have known Juan Coloso a very long time. Thank you so much. Uh, I love that passage. Uh, it, speaking of disrupting stereotypes, as uh, you mentioned, that took place in 1964. So if we think about the global context at that point in time, there was a space race, but eyes were trained on the US, Russia, Northern entities, right? And so here, you have uh, highlighted the small country in Africa, one place that people may not know very well that is doing remarkable things, including a woman 
in the space program. So this, you know, this is yeah. a story. And, and uh, it, it's funny because when people read my book, they don't know what's real and what's not. They're, you know, the woman covered in hair growing down her body is not real. But Mata Mwamba and the space program raising 12 cats was real. Everything I just read is based on uh, journalistic reports from the time and interviews um, conducted between Arthur Hopp, a San Francisco journalist, and, and Ms. Mata Mwamba. Um, and when I when I talk to people about the space program, they often think Nkoloso is a bit of a crackpot, um, a bit of a lunatic, or maybe an Afrofuturist visionary, you know, a little bit like Sun Ra. Um, but very rarely do they notice the politics implicit in what he was doing, right? So that he had a female astronaut who was the star astronaut of his program, um, that he had educated her, had taught her science and math and how to fix an engine, how to drive. Um, she, and if the real Natha Mwamba ended up being the first um, female bus driver for the for the Zambian bus service. Um, and that, and also that, you know, when, when he talks about getting to, to Mars and, um, and offering Christianity to the, the primitives that they've cited there, but not forcing it on them unless they want it, that's a political statement, right? That is, a, that is an attempt to redress the forcible um, imposition of Christianity on Africans by missionaries from the West for, for centuries. Yeah, it you know uh, this story is is quite compelling, and in the last few months, I've had a number of conversations <laughs> about Matha Mwamba yeah. and the fact that she real. Um, yeah, and actually, fun fact: my mom was part of the um, National um, okay. Academy for Science and Research, or I believe. So she was That's one of the first mean. members of that in the seventies. So talk about elevating voices of women and um, providing equitable experiences to women. There were a number of powerful women that came up uh, in, the, in those days. In those days where here, women were struggling for leadership and for access to education and, 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 and so on. So once again, disrupting those stereotypes. Um, so I, as we talked about this discussion and we prepared for today, one of the things that you mentioned was um, the type of readers that come to your book and, and, and kind of this willful um, ignorance or this desire to kind of cling on to certain ideas. For you to chat a little bit about that, um, especially given the facts yeah. of the story and that I we think, just read. So, yeah. There's a lot of um, anxiety about the thing that I said earlier about the fact that parts of the novel are fictional and parts of them are nonfiction, and that I don't have footnotes or uh, annotations or screaming all caps, you know, letters saying um, this actually happened or this didn't. And I think part of that is because there's an expectation that African literature is going to teach you something that it's um, that it's pedagogical or even didactic in mm -hmm. some way um, and that this is a way to um, you know it's, it's somehow uh, irresponsible of me to um, to not mark what is real and what isn't but there's but if you know if you think about what it would be like if I wrote a novel where I talked about um, the NASA space launch um, you know that that actually took us to the moon that's so well known as a historical fact that people would know that I was referring to something real. Do you see what I mean? So there's a sense that there's this kind of um, imbalance of what is general knowledge um, about the history and context of my country um, and, and what is known about the rest of the world. And so one of the things I'm, I'm trying to do in the book is, is to throw you on your back foot if you don't know this history, to actually do some reading and to like learn some things, <laughs> um, but not necessarily from a novel. Right, my novel is not a tourist guide. It's not a history book, um, but it plays with the history and culture um, of of of, uh, of Zambia. And one of my favorite things um, about the novel is talking to Zambian readers, some of whom don't know this history either, because of what is you know they might know about World War II, but they they wouldn't necessarily know that the Northern Rhodesian Regiment sent men like Nkoloso to Burma to fight for the British, right? 
they don't they don't necessarily know about our role um, in world history. Um, but there's a sense of oh wow, you're you're it it it, it excites me and it inspires me to go and learn more, um, which I think is really um, is really great. Um, I think you know. Uh, Translating words um, is another kind of uh, version of this. There are people who feel very frustrated that I don't translate the Zambian language words in the novel, but they haven't complained about the Italian words that I include, uh, however, right? So there, again, there's a sense of like, what is Googleable and what is not? <laughs> um, what, what, what ought to be handed to the reader who comes to certain expectations um, and what actually um, the novel is trying to present on its own terms, um, I, I think it's been it's been interesting to see how different audiences have have reacted. Yeah, um, that makes the the book a wonderful mirror. It it, it helps us reflect mm -hmm. to ourselves our understanding um, of the world and kind of bring to light um, how our our inherent imbalance of knowledge, right? And like you said, there's um, this discussion about even equitable access to history, historical information about uh, different parts of the world and so on. So it's, that's absolutely wonderful. So uh, transitioning a little bit, um, could you tell me a little bit about women? So we, we have uh, highlighted Matha, Matha Mwamba, and uh, as you know, she's my favorite character. And um, anyone who's watching, you, you don't have to love Matha. <laughs> there are so many characters to choose from. Um, and Namali and I talked a little bit about the fact that uh, every time she talks to someone, they have a new favorite character. And, and, and I think mm -hmm. every character now has a fan club. So, uh, but yeah, but there, there are many women that are showcased in your book. And uh, I love how you center women's experiences. You kind of just, you bring to the floor of discussion what things that happen to women's bodies that are normal that we often might jettison or kind of put aside. Um, but I, I think how the way that women come through in this book, they exist as people. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about, about your inspiration with that and then also what you were communicating through, yeah, I mean, through I these there, various there characters? There were telling uh, experiences that I had upon publication which I didn't expect. And so one was that um, people would often um, say that the, the generations in the novel are the grandmothers, the mothers, and the daughters. But that last section is in fact called the children. Um, and it's actually made up of two male characters. Mm -hmm. And and then as, as I mentioned earlier, the, the original um, generation with, that starts this whole cycle between the three families is three men. So it, it was very interesting to me that the men just sort of like fell to the side. Um, and I, it made me realize a couple of things. One was that I had written a, 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 a novel centered around women, but I hadn't realized it and I hadn't done it with any kind of intention. I just had written about the characters that I wanted to write about that I was most interested in. And the other, you know, I was, uh, because of the, the coronavirus, there's been a lot of interest in um, the plague and in uh, fictions and histories of the plague, including um, Boccaccio's The Decameron. And I read somewhere that The Decameron has all of these different storytellers, but the, the, that it's like eight of them, eight of the 10 are women. But no one goes around saying that the Cameron is a woman's book, right? <laughs> you know? Which I think is really interesting. It's like if I had written a novel where all but you know all but three characters uh, were men, would this be called a male book? I don't think it would. I think it would be like it's a human story. You know what I mean? So I'm not very happy. My 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 feminism is so built in that it's just like I'm just writing about people, and people are like, "Oh, but you're writing about women," and I'm like, "Oh, right, they're people too," <laughs> and they're like, they are primary people in my conception um, of of the world and in, in you know of this book. I also found it really interesting how um, surprising and shocking people found my depictions of very basic, very normal and common things like menstruation 
for female sexual desire. You know, um, the idea that you know you could write about your period or write about sex that it's still a scandal in the 21st century. I find pretty remarkable, given that it is a, a monthly occurrence for half the world's population, right? So I, I think my my you know my um, interest in in women's issues is 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 sort of just built in. Um, I grew up in a in a female centered household. You know, me and my sisters and my poor father. <laughs> um, and my older brother was away for a lot of time, and uh, and a, a very feminist family. You know, there was never a question that women could were not allowed to or were not able to do what men could do. It was just, it wasn't even a topic of conversation. It was just assumed. Um, so I think in writing in that mode um, in the in the book, it is, it's coming as a, as a surprise to, to some readers, but I think that's more a, a result of the, the literary landscape that we're still in, where women's literature is still considered women's literature as opposed to just literature. Um, and there's still a, a, a huge imbalance in um, how many books by women are reviewed by women in major publications in the West. Um, so I think, you know, I, I've, I've been interested to see how that fundamental centering of, of women's experience as human experience in my book has been perceived as kind of radically feminist, when to me it's very normal. Yeah. Yeah. Once again, this aspect of a mirror and kind of looking at mm -hmm. what we have decided collectively as normal, you know, what we've normalized. And like, as you mentioned, a book that would have um, a male protagonist and primarily male characters is considered a book. <laughs> this is not, it's, it's not um, a male book. It's just a book. And so um, the idea of social justice embedded in the idea of social justice is elevating voices so that we can decentralize our understanding of normal, right? And so um, I, I appreciate your perspective when we when we talk about women's issues um, in, and when you talk about women and your framing associated with it. It's just, these are just people. I think that this book has a really great way of um, allowing its characters to exist in the fullness of their humanity. They're able to be people. So um, Matha Mwamba mm -hmm. is this, and so once again, favorite character. Um, she's this trailblazing woman, um, but yet in throughout the book, uh, mm -hmm. she, there are moments where she is she's crying, and and one might be thinking that she's crying because of her socioeconomic status and what she has access to in terms of um, monetary value, and it has nothing to do with what she has. It has everything to do with the fact that she has a broken heart. So every person in your book is allowed to have the full spectrum of what it means to be human, and so um, I think we forget that our inherent case of our inherent sense of normal often robs people of the ability to be their full selves. Why is it surprising when we focus on a movement story? Why is it surprising that a country in Africa is, has this interesting setup that is so diverse and acknowledges all of these different viewpoints? And, and not to say that yeah. <laughs> Zambia is perfect by any means, because it's not. Um, it, it's not at all, but there are lessons to be learned. and. Um, so as we got into our discussion, I, I kind of skipped over the introduction associated with me. I, I'm an associate professor at Baldwin Wallace University. And um, one of the things that I do is I coordinate um, a, a program that focuses on professional development, international education, community engagement with between our partners in Zambia and the university. And as we have these interactions, a question I'm constantly asking myself is, how is, are all the voices at the table heard? And are we learning from our friends in Zambia? Are we, are we seeing each other as partners and, and seeing um, that everybody can exist in the full spectrum of their humanity? And your book just does such a wonderful job of that. So um, next question, um, <laughs> taking a little bit of a light note. You have a character that I find absolutely charming and fascinating in here, Aunt Beatrice. Why does everyone 
they have an Aunt Beatrice. Can you, can you tell me? Um, because I know I have an Aunt Beatrice. I have a couple. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, there, there are different parts yeah. of it. I mean, people often ask me, um, are you this character? Are you that character? A lot of people assume that I'm Nyla because she's young and she's, you know, um, uh, in the in the last generation, and and um, and because I guess because her name begins with an N A as does mine, but I'm like, well, she's half Indian, half Italian, so no. Um, <laughs> um, but there are different experiences <laughs> from my life that I have incorporated into the novel. Um, and, and unless you knew my life very well, it'd be very hard to tell. But on Beatrice, as you say, is based on on a real. Um, experience, which is, you know, the auntie culture um, in, in Zambia is very intense, right? And um, my mother had, uh, you know, a lot of um, older siblings. She was the second to youngest of nine. Um, and so it means that your her older siblings were, were, you know, generations older and had a very different uh, kind of um, relationship to the whole family. They were essentially matriarchs, right? They were essentially the, the kinds of heads of these extended families. And um, so Aunt Beatrice, you know, is, um, is the person to whom you go to appeal when you are, when you are <laughs> lonely, mm -hmm. when you need help. But she's, so she's very imperious. Um, and she has, but at the same time, there's, there's a sense that she is, you know, she's accommodating everybody in, you know, in what we call, you know, um, uh, Zambian socialism, which is like a socialism of the family, right? Where if you have, then you give, yes. and you give to your family. And so there's this kind of trickle down economics, and at the top of it is is an is an Aunt Beatrice. But you know, those women also uh, make decisions about they they're kind of work like Supreme Court justices, right? Within the family, like have have you done enough? Have you educated yourself? Have you taken care of your children? Have you, and if you haven't, they also wield a lot of power in terms of um, rearranging family structures to make sure people are taken care of. But at the same time, also isolating certain people who really have not done their job and being part of this family social. Um, network so it's, just, it's like the, the family becomes a little miniature nation you know and the aunt business is at the top yeah yeah absolutely and so i i, I love that um we, we found a way to take care of our own in different ways so where we may not be able to always rely on the government or um and even our government is is, is socialistic in nature so um, we have embedded in the fabric of our, our being this understanding of taking care of one another in government and also within our families. <laughs> so I, I just looked at the clock and um, I, I am running a bit behind. So <laughs> I will get us a little bit more on track. We have about, I think, 15 minutes. And in that time, we would like to take some questions from the audience. Um, and so I am going to to see if I can see any questions in the chat. So, yeah. Um, I'm would not love seeing any questions from the audience. Legacy, revolution. This is a, a question from Alice Cowboy. Um, and yeah, so I, I wrote a, a New Yorker article about the Bandy State program um, a couple of years ago where um, I took the, you know, the West's perception of him in all of these different newspapers from the time and his TV footage. You can see his, his do-it-yourself training techniques of rolling people down nose in oil barrels and swinging them um, on YouTube if you wanted to Google it. It's there. Um, I tried to reconcile that picture of him with what, you know, when you talk about Juan Colosa at home, people are like, oh, he was a freedom fighter. He was a big part of our, um, our movement toward independence um, in, the, in the late 50s, early 60s. And so, you know, the archival research that I did basically spilled out um, a picture of that story. I interviewed people who knew him, but I also found a lot of records about him um, in the Zambia National Archives, or National Archives of Zambia, which is right around the, um, the Anglican Cathedral in Misaka. And uh, he, you know, not only fought for the British in Burma, but when he came back, 
he basically came back and was uh, but he was radicalized by coming back as many soldiers who fought for the Western powers came back to their home country. They're like, where are our rights? You've not, you know, it's like, and, and in Zambia, which is a majority uh, African country, majority black country, it was especially, especially Gaul. They wouldn't let him set up his own school. So he set up a roadside academy because they kept shutting him down. So this increasingly, I think, built up, and then he was, he yeah. became part of a council, um, which was the only, a tribal council, which was like the only real um, place that um, Native Africans had a say in government in the, in the colonial period. And I could, you can read his transcript, and he's arguing for integrating schools. He's arguing for giving uh, young girls access to education. He's arguing all sorts of very, very high-level, very sophisticated things. So the man was, was educated. You know, he, he he spoke and and wrote in English and in Bemba fluently. He was writing letters, you know, to the. Um, uh, what would become the United National Independence Party to to me. He also writing letters to the Queen of England, requesting, you know, um, that he and his people who had been arrested for various strikes um, in the Copper Belt or for you know um, civil dis disobedience campaigns that he was running um, in his village, uh, and they were you know they were arrested. Some said he was tortured by the British, and KK Kenneth Fonda, who grew up with him was talking to parliamentary figures in England saying, this is what they're doing to our people. <laughs> they he used his, his story, his local story, as an example of why they needed to be independent. So it's a big part of our, um, uh, our freedom um, movement. And I do think, you know, because he was, uh, he was training his space program people in the same place that he was training other political figures from, Mozambique, from um, Zimbabwe, from places around Zambia that had yet to achieve independence. I actually think he was maybe um, also training the United States program to get in the revolutionary activity. They were all very politically involved, not from one that um, So I don't know if it was a cover for revolutionary activity, but the two were very much connected in his mind. Absolutely. So Karen uh, Long of the Annisfield Book Book Awards, hi Karen, um, asked Professor Serpo, um, I believe that you teach a college course in black on um, black science fiction. I mean, what should we be black reading now? The class I teach is um, starts with you know um, the 19th century. Um, you may not know this, but W. E. B. Du Bois wrote uh, science fiction and fantasy. Um, one of his uh, short stories is called The Comet, and uh, Comet hits New York City, and the only two people sur who survive are a black man and a white woman. I'm like, how will the human, how will the human race survive? You know, in a in a Jim Crow world where those two people can't even look at each other. Right. So um, there's also a, a novel called Black No More from the Harlem Renaissance by George Schuyler, which there's a machine that turns black people white. Um, and chaos uh, ensues. Um, so there's all sorts of really great stuff. And in fact, I just um, have been working on a book from 1905 that I just discovered, um, which has elements of science fiction as well. So there's a, a long history. There's older books you can read. In my course, I teach Octavia Butler. I teach Samuel Delaney, of course. Um, they're wonderful um, uh, writers. Um, I love Delaney's book, Babel 17. It's uh, it's an earlier work of his, but um, it's a, a remarkable book. There's also one, um, uh, a short story of his, which is almost novella length, um, which is it's in uh, uh, I and Gamora. Um, it's in that collection. Um, and what's amazing about the stories from these moments is that they, uh, from these earlier periods, like the 60s and 70s and 80s, is there so much more radical than even what we watch on TV in terms of like gender bending, polyamorous, you know, groups of people? Like the the way that both Butler and Delaney are conceiving of a future world and are able to predict things like you know, um, Archie Butler's parable of the sower is so exactly attuned to our current moments of fascism in this country. It's just remarkable how um, forward thinking they are. 
I'd also really recommend um, Matt Johnson's Pym, which is a great science fiction book and works by um, uh, Victor Laval. Um, he's a great fantasy and science fiction writer as well. His book, The Changeling, is just brilliant and it's wonderful. Uh, and then there's um, Nnedi Okorafor's book, Lagoon, which is set in Lagos, is a wonderful book. Um, it's, we're, we're at a very booming moment for Afrofuturism, so there's, there's tons and tons of things. Um, I'll just, the, the title of the um, an Octavia Butler story that I wish everybody would read is called The Evening and the Morning and the Night. It's just, it's stunning. It's, it's a really brilliant, brilliant story. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and so I, I believe I saw another question. Um, oh no, we, we had a call for as much literature as possible and you did that, that was wonderful. Um, there, there's a question about your process in, in being published. Um, uh, Joseph Meisner asked, can you tell us of any struggles you've had in getting published? Uh, published, how have you overcome these? Um, for so many of us unknown writers, it turns out that getting published and noticed is far more difficult of a struggle mm -hmm. than writing our work. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I would like to tack on an extra question in there, just because there aren't, <laughs> as if four questions isn't enough. Um, I would like to hear a little bit about um, your interaction with these prizes that you're winning and um, your perspective as it pertains to how writers are kind of pit against each other in, in getting recognized in um, winning awards and things. So, um, so in terms of, of, of getting published, I think, I think one of the, whenever people ask me about this, like, how do I get published? Um, my first question is, well, why do you want to be published? What is it that makes you want to get your work out to uh, audiences? Because the reason behind why you want to be published dictates how you should go about it, right? So if, if, if your goal is to reach a certain kind of audience, then you, then you go directly to that audience, right? So there are ways to cultivate an audience that have to do with sharing your work with other readers or writers of that kind of fiction. Fans and readers have a lot of power now than they, a lot more than they used to in a lot of ways. But if what, you know, if your aim is, uh, is sort of more oriented toward um, getting fame and recognition, you know, those paths are, are, are very well grouped um, when it comes to the publishing industry. You have to have a certain kind of credentializing, you're producing work, you know, getting an MFA, building a network, and getting an agent, really getting a literary agent who is going to do the work of showcasing you, um, you know, to, to publishers is, is kind of essential these days. So it, it really depends on, on what your what your goal is. Um, for me, the struggles that I've had in these years have had more to do with um, the specific kind of thing I wanted to publish, um, especially earlier on in my career. So there was a real resistance to anything new, to anything novel. So when I was an undergraduate and first started writing this book, I started writing this book in, in college. Um, the other students uh, in the course and even the professors were very confused about that that I had multiple genres in my book, and you know the book was the first chapter I wrote had three people from the same family, but they were all in different genres. So my grandmother was magical realist; she was crying endlessly, and endless tears, and you know my like something from Marquez, from the big influence. The daughter, it was just straight social realism. She was a sex worker with HIV AIDS, negotiating her love life basically, and then her son. The grandson was very interested in science and technology. And so it was already moving toward a kind of science fiction. And the last third of my book is science fiction. So this is the year 2000. They were like, I don't understand. Like, how is this? First of all, this is not possible in Zambia. Second of all, how, is, is the son going to learn how to fly? Like, what, what, like, why are you writing these different genres? And then, you know, a few years later, um, do you know he has publishers, the brief one to talk about as well. David Mitchell publishes Cloud Atlas, which is multi-genre. 
And suddenly I have comrades in the world who have more clout and more prestige, and I can point to them and be like, they're doing what I'm trying to do. And so there's a way in which I, you know, having to have more confidence, but also patience for your readership to catch up to what you're doing was very important. But, you know, I'm having this thing right now where mm. as, as I publish more things, um, you know, there's some people that like see that you have something, they see you have an idea, and they, they grab it and they run with you. You know, so my agent is one of those people, my first published story, and I've stuck with him ever since because he sees what I'm doing. He sees the potential in what I'm doing. You need that one person to believe in you and advocate for you because anything you write that's new, people are going to fall. So I'm having this interesting moment now that I've published, I've won the prizes, et cetera, et cetera. I've been getting a lot of people trying to recruit me to write about things, especially about black things, because they need more black writers. And suddenly it has become aware, it has become aware that, you know, if you're going to write about a black artist or a black musician, it's better to have a black writer interviewing them and things like that. But they're writing to me asking me to, to write about things that I have no interest in and that I have not, I've never expressed an interest in, I've never you know, West African cinema, you know, r and the 70s. I'm like, I like them, but that's not my thing, right? And, but at the same time, I have two or three essays about what I am interested in that I just cannot solve. Like I've sent, you know, an, a, one particular essay to five different venues that have published other pieces by me. And they're like, ah, ah, doesn't quite fit, you know? But just to say, it's a constant battle. It's a constant battle of trying to get people to hear you, see what you are interested in, see what you have to say, um, and get that to a wider audience. And it really does take like bravery on the part of editors and of agents to take people on. And I, I wish I had advice about that. I, I do think it is better to stick to your interests and to stick to your style and your gun when it comes to what you want to do and wait for them to catch up to you than to try to cater what you're doing to an audience. Because the audience always is going to want something easier, more palatable, and so on and so forth. And that's just going to take away from, from the novelty of what you're doing. Um, so I would say, you know, stick to your guns and find your people. Find people who, who see you and recognize uh, what you're doing. Yeah, um, I, I love that. Be true to yourself. Be true to yourself, be genuine um, and, and find your people. I think that that's absolutely wonderful. Um, and, and so I, I will retract my question and frame it into a statement and say, I've really enjoyed watching your process and seeing how you use your voice to, to elevate the voices of others um, through your uh, increased privilege and power and platform. I, uh, I think as we opened our discussion, um, mm -hmm. you giving your prize money away is a demonstration of that. And, and that's not the first time that you've done that. You've done that multiple times. And so I, I think that, um, it, as you've said, you have a vision and you've stuck with that vision. And I really, mm -hmm. really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> so, I, we have about two more minutes, and so in this two, in these two minutes, I'd like to to say a special thank you again to the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards. Um, I am so privileged to be in a great city, to be in Cleveland, Ohio, where we're um, we're heralding diversity. And so, Annisfield Wolf Book Awards is the only jury book awards that look at race and diversity in the way that they do. And so. Thank you so much for having that as, as a founding principle. Thank you so much for elevating voices that are, are really um, asking some tough questions. And in this time, we recognize it's so important for us to uh, interrogate existing oppressive structures within our, our, ourselves, but within our communities as well. Um, thank you, Namwali, for your work. Um, <laughs> You mentioned Black Panther earlier, and I, I felt kind of like Trevor Noah as he was watching Black Panther, uh, listening to his language being spoken on the mm -hmm. screen. It was so <laughs> wonderful to read Bemba words, to read different mm -hmm. um, words that are in our language um, in your book. It, it felt like a personal letter to me, and I know that there are many recipients of this personal letter. Um, 
And so, and thank you for, for everyone who joined us today and for everyone who watches this. Thank you so much for taking some time and listening to Namwale and I discuss this book. Lastly, I would like to make um, an announcement. Tonight, um, there's an idea stream documentary that will feature Namwale as one of, one of 2020's um, Anna's Field Wolf Book Award winners. And so that will be broadcast through the Anna's Field Wolf Book Award um, website at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So 8 p.m. tonight, please catch that documentary. Well, we are, it's exactly 3.30. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you. And, um, Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you Any so five? Okay. Thank you.